Hello, and welcome to the nonprofit panel here at the Bitcoin Conference 2013. We're in uh, San Jose. I'm so glad everybody could come out today. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, and we're so excited to have the chance to talk about how Bitcoin is great for nonprofit organizations and charities, or whatever you'd like to call them, and how nonprofits are great for Bitcoin. So uh, thanks for you know, having, uh, we're so glad to have the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, want to thank the conference organizers, you know, the Bitcoin Foundation and Lindsay Holland. And also, we are here with the help of Bitcoin Not Bombs. And just want to make sure we thank them because they're the ones who have helped us get here and promote our organizations. Bitcoin Not Bombs is a launching pad for Bitcoin nonprofits. And you can check them out at the booth over there in the convention center or at bitcoinnotbombs.com. You'll also find links to all of our individual organizations there. I am Stephanie Murphy. I am uh, working with Free Aid, which is a volunteer first aid organization, and uh, Teresa Warmke is my partner at Free Aid. I'm going to be your moderator for today. I'm also a Bitcoin podcaster, and I've been really excited about Bitcoin since 2011. So I have a very keen interest in this subject of Bitcoin and nonprofits. Also on the panel with me, we've got Angela Keaton. She is a director of operations at antiwar.com. This is the world's largest source. Uh, best source, I think, <laughs> for anti-war news, news and views. Um, and you can find them at antiwar.com. We've also got Carla Garrick. She is a former attorney. She's originally from South Africa. And right now she is uh, serving as the president of the Free State Project. The Free State Project is an organization that is dedicated to getting people who love freedom and liberty. And I know there are a lot of people who love freedom and liberty at this conference, <laughs> at the Bitcoin conference. So it's dedicated to getting liberty lovers to move to one place, that is New Hampshire. I actually live in New Hampshire, full disclosure. I've lived there since 2006, and I'm a huge fan of the Free State Project. So Carla, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And then we've got Teresa Warmke. She is the treasurer at Free Aid and, and co-founder of Free Aid. And Free Aid is a, a volunteer first aid and a educational and networking organization uh, in the healthcare field. And uh, she's also doing a lot of other things that are in the nonprofit sector. Teresa organizes uh, Bay Area Voluntarias. So if you live in the Bay Area, you want to meet up with her, you can find out more about that. And she's also uh, the uh, founder of Sonoma County Full Picture, which uh, kind of talks about alternatives to military service for young people. So ladies, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'm really excited about this. And let's get started with this panel, shall we? I would like to hear a little bit, yes, thank you. <laughs> I would like to hear, to start off, um, just tell me a little bit about sort of the core mission of your organization, just, you know, in a couple sentences. Let's start with Angela. Um, Antiwar.com, uh, we serve as a news source, and we're basically an educational outlet for news and views against the empire. Uh, we're pretty straightforward. It says they're right on the page, antiwar.com. It's US, it's a U.S. foreign policy from an anti-interventionist perspective. We've been doing it for 17 years. And um, we just see the future in Bitcoin. Really excited. Thank you, Stephanie. Yep, and Carla? Um, as Stephanie said, oh, I'm loud. <laughs> you sound good. As, as Stephanie said, um, the Free State Project is a geopolitical movement to try and concentrate freedom levers in one state, and that state is New Hampshire. That state was chosen for several reasons. It often uh, comes up as the freest state in America. It's very low tax, it's very small business friendly, and basically what we're trying to do is to concentrate people in one place so that we can actually affect change. One of the largest challenges, I believe, for libertarians or freedom lovers is we're all over the place and we're not effective. So the idea is that we would bring everyone to one place. People tend to work on sort of three fronts. They um, either work in the system or they work outside the system with civil disobedience or the part that I'm most excited about of course is sort of the agora or the free markets and we have a very strong Bitcoin presence here the Lama Sioux guys I'm sure you guys saw their money changing machine you know you put FRNs in and you get Bitcoins back I can't imagine something that's better they're free staters they've moved there and so my hope really with our mission is to attract the finest minds working now who believe in freedom and liberty into one place where we can kind of create, similar to Silicon Valley, where we can create a mill yard um, of, of freedom and of ideas and of entrepreneurship. 
And Teresa, tell me more about Free Aid. Sure. Um, we, By the way, we should mention it's, if you want to visit us online, it's fr33aid, A-I-D. Dot com. Dot yes. com. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, it's, uh, the main thing we do is we support volunteers. We're an all-volunteer organization, and we support volunteers who want to do projects that educate people about the value of mutual aid, and we're really focused on uh, the healthcare field. Um, we're an organization of medically skilled liberty lovers, and one of our first projects was the Free Hearts Project, which is uh, educating people about CPR and defibrillation. I've worked in medical devices for over 20 years, and I donated my uh, automated defibrillator to Free Aid, and we use it to do demonstrations on how easy it is to uh, help each other if someone has a cardiac arrest uh, before government providers can arrive. And we have many volunteers of you know EMTs, paramedics, nurses. Um, we even have a medical technician, um, all kinds of different people across the field, mental health as well. We we'll also do networking for yes. um, medically skilled liberty lovers. So right. if you are one, you can volunteer with us. <laughs> yes, they're from all over the world, and a lot of them uh, opt to provide uh, first aid services for free at events like Porkfest, which is put on by the Free State Project. Okay. And it's a big uh, reunion every time we get together there at Porkfest um, for our team. So it's right. great. So I'd like to hear a little bit about when each of you, uh, each of your organizations started to accept Bitcoin. Tell me about the when, why, and how. Why did you get into Bitcoins? When did you start accepting them? And how did you start out? Um, I think I started the first uh, bit of trickling insane emails from uh, my kookier <laughs> friends, like in probably 2010. And like every year, I said, oh no, not another libertarian trend, here we go. But, <laughs> You know, of course, dragged, kicking, and screaming, we're just, you know, consumer demand and um, the help of people, of services like the people who run Bitcoin, not bombs, made it really easy. So by, I think, November of 2012, we really started, you know, in earnest taking Bitcoin and being really proud of it because, you know, why fight it? It's here. Carla. Sure. Um, so as I said, we have a lot of early adopters in, uh, in the Bitcoin field in our group. So uh, we started, I believe, back in at Liberty Forum in 2011. And um, we That's started accepting re registrations. And Liberty Forum is our, our winter event. Um, that's sort of the sister event to the Porcupine Freedom Festival that Teresa was talking about. And since then, we've accepted Bitcoin as registration fees for both of those events. And we've uh, recently, probably in the past year, started to accept Bitcoins as donations as well. And we can talk about maybe some of the pros and cons of that in a bit. All right. Uh, for free aid, we started accepting bitcoins in 2011, uh, and we, you know, posted our address online. And uh, then, uh, but we didn't get our first donation until early 2012, when Stephanie asked, "Who's going to be free aid's first bitcoin donor?" And suddenly, we had a, a, quite a few all at once. Um, <laughs> thanks, Stephanie. Stephanie does a lot of different podcasts and uh, got the word out for us. Uh, so um, we're, we're and just recently, uh, last uh, April 15th, tax day, we decided to uh, announce that we are a bitcoin-based organization. So now we operate primarily in bitcoin. I have less than ten dollars in our bank account and um, we just got a t-shirt order online so we have like twenty eight dollars in our PayPal account but um, we we convert all of our uh, money into Bitcoin uh, it's very convenient here with a Lama Sioux machine right next door to our booth so um, I'm very proud to be very into the Bitcoin economy with free aid yeah so what do you ladies do with your bitcoins that your organizations receive I mean uh, one of the complaints, I guess, right now, while we're in the early adopter phases of Bitcoin, is well, you can't really buy a lot of stuff with them. So wh what do you do with them? Do you save them? Do you spend them? Do you use them to, for reimbursements? Um, do you change them into dollars? Tell me more about that. First of all, you know, we, when we started actually taking it, we called it around the um, staff the Bitcoin experiment because we didn't want to be you know, permanently married to another trend that comes and goes because in the libertarian movement of which we're kind of a part of is that people are very, very interested in trying the alternative currencies and looking at economics from a very different perspective. So um, 
but so right now it's sort of been like adapting to whatever the needs are. I mean, we're a nonprofit that you know is 24/7 and has a very small staff, but a lot of you know things that need to be done every day. So sometimes maybe every so many days I make the mental note convert the the Bitcoin. But also because of the nature of the um, of the people who use Bitcoin among people who read and donate, it also allows me to exchange with some people, for example, um, people who did some consulting. I paid it in Bitcoin for the first time and made that exchange internally. So that's right. Right now we're just kind of adapting to needs and kind of seeing how it goes and willing to just enjoy the Bitcoin ride. Yeah, so you've done both. You've paid for services yes. and you've also converted Bitcoins mm -hmm. into dollars. And are you holding any right now? Yes, this weekend are, we are holding, and I just, you know, I know the issue of a Bitcoin, you know, flotility and speculation is just that we are kind of in solidarity, one, with the Bitcoin conference, just to leave it in the account and show that we're doing things with it this weekend, but, sure. you know. Well, I guess how, it's a philosophical question, right? How long do you have to hold to be holding, but, you know, <laughs> you, you, hold, you have to hold it for a weekend or a month or what? <laughs> what about you, Carla? So I would say primarily we're doing pretty much the same thing. Um, we're converting back into FRNs. Um, um, just for right now, and here is by way of example, Satoshi Dice, who's uh, sponsoring the Wi-Fi at this conference, is also one of our big sponsors for the Porcupine Freedom Festival this year. And, you know, they gave us a significant platinum sponsorship. Uh, so I don't know how they timed this part, you know, but the money came in pretty much up there at the 260 mark. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, that was great, but that was also one of those situations where it could be a high-risk situation because of the volatility and the fact that the money started to drop. Now, fortunately, in our organization, we have a treasurer who's really on the ball, and he converted the next day, you know, so we, didn't, we did okay. Like, we didn't really lose any money, but it did sort of drive that point home of, right. I think, to some extent, you know, we all went into this and we're like, it's easy to use, it's, you know, easy on the website. Uh, we have a lot of our constituents are Bitcoin people, so people are excited and they want to give us money that way. But there are also those issues where you kind of have to be watching it. We have started also now, you know, with something like Bitcoin, not bombs. Um, you know, we use donations here to all bring us here to be able to come and speak to you guys and really spread the word and to make you cognizant of, you know, there's the techie world and then people are trying to do the businesses. But nonprofits are a um, really vital point, I think, of starting to spread the story of Bitcoins in a really positive way because we can also be the early adopters that help to say this is a great way in an alternate currency or a cryptocurrency to get out of, you know, the fiat system. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, free aid being Bitcoin based, we, um, we're always accepting Bitcoin. And uh, like I said, our main goal is to support volunteers who do projects. And so most of our volunteers are really excited about Bitcoin. And um, when we became Bitcoin based, uh, we, um, Matt from Lamasu helped a lot of them get started with Bitcoin. And so we have a lot of uh, Liberty lovers who are now using Bitcoin because we went Bitcoin based. So when they start a project, they usually incur the expenses themselves and we reimburse them for those. Like um, Jacob, one of our EMTs, bought a mannequin and um, that for CPR teaching mannequin. CPR <laughs> mannequin. Yeah, sorry. He CPR bought a blow up for doll. Modeling clothes. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he did that too, I don't know, but, uh, but yeah, he got a CPR mannequin, for example, and we reimbursed him back then uh, before we became Bitcoin based, but now, um, and we also subsidize our proven volunteers who uh, need to travel for a ways to Porkfest, and they were delighted that we were able to offer them, these, this group of proven volunteers, uh, one Bitcoin each, and uh, so they were excited about that. So we're always spending Bitcoin and, and getting Bitcoin donations, and um, um, whenever we get cash donations, I go through a uh, contact I met through localbitcoins.com who uh, is willing to quote me uh, spot price Mt. Gox at any time I want to give him cash, any amount of Bitcoin I can buy from him. And he lives two miles away from me. So uh, local bitcoins uh, has become my favorite way to do banking. 
And before the conference, um, my daughter had a concert um, that ended at around 9.30, and I asked him, hey, can I, um, can I come see you at 9.30 tonight? And he said, sure, I'm here getting ready for the conference, doing some hack hackathoning with my friend. And, <laughs> and uh, I just came over and did a deal with him and um, was able to get our bank account down under $10 before coming here. So <laughs> That's what you call friendly banking. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, he's a uh, design dream on, on uh, um, and if anyone wants to know him on local bitcoins. And so we, we don't worry about the volatility as much because it's kind of averaged out over time. Uh, and, uh, and we were pretty fortunate in our timing, unlike the Satoshi Dice <laughs> sponsorship. Yeah. So, I mean, there is also this aspect of Bitcoin being a deflationary currency, uh, at least so far from what we've seen overall historically. It's been appreciating quite a bit over time. And so do you ladies think that creates a conflict of interest for a charity who maybe people expect to be using donations right away? Um, there is kind of an incentive to save or to hold. I don't like the word hoard, but to save, you know, with a deflationary currency. So what do you ladies think about that? Do you think there's a tension? Um, does public pressure uh, play a role in that at all, making sure charities are spending their Bitcoin donations? Um, I think that, you know, this, because this is still so new, people are still so figuring it out. And I think um, from a corporate governance standpoint, at some stage, people will start to go, okay, this makes sense. Um, depending, you know, and we all kind of do it in a little different way, but if, you know, you're going to say 40% needs to be converted to FRNs, we're going to use that. But I could see it becoming actually, you know, let's say you keep 20% in Bitcoin and you just disclose that to your board. And basically what you're saying to them is, hey, um, we're going to save this part this is going to be something that we see as a fund that over time is going to reap greater rewards. Right. Yeah, and for free aid, um, we, uh, we believe in transparency absolutely. Um, in the next two months, we're going to post financial information similar to what the IRS would require. We just want to be very transparent. But Bitcoin really helps us be that, have that level of transparency. We, um, we went to, through the Vanity Gen to get a free aid address. And, so the Bitcoin um, anyone, address actually says our organization's yeah, name in it. So. It's one free aid to start with. And, um, and uh, we had also help from our Bitcoin consultant, Matt from Lamasu, with um, getting that done. And, uh, and then uh, any one can look up that address in the blockchain and see. And I've started to, to put in the notations whenever I send uh, a Bitcoin to one of our first aid volunteers that's coming to Fort Parkrest. I'll say a notation like PFX uh, volunteer subsidy, uh, uh, re, you know, volunteer travel subsidy. So people can see, have very transparent information about us as a charity. And um, we were holding more Bitcoin than I would normally like to hold um, before this event because I wasn't sure how much we were going to raise and I wasn't sure how much we were going to be able to offer to volunteers. But I just decided to go forward with the one Bitcoin. And if we can increase that later, we will, um, depending on how much funds we raise and with the support from Bitcoin Not Bombs, as uh, Stephanie and, and, and my colleagues have been saying. Um, um, we're doing a lot of good fundraising here, and a lot of people are buying shirts, and that's awesome. And, yeah, um, the Bitcoin Not Bombs t-shirts, you can find those over at our booth. Show them. <laughs> yeah, shirts, yeah, Mark's wearing a nice, our nice B word cloud there. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Uh, so I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to spend more sooner. But we also have to be careful. You know, one of our volunteers is thinking about starting a disaster services program, which would be fantastic. And when, when that happens, I know the Red Cross gets a lot of flack for this, but I actually support it. Like, they need to be able to respond within minutes whenever a disaster hits. And that's a kind of a form of self-insurance. And if you don't want to have to rely on loans and all kinds of, and all kinds of paperwork that t delays you and takes a long time, it's really nice for them to just be able to immediately offer cards that will allow people to get a hotel room if they need it. And I want Free Aid to be able to offer some of that same kind of service. And if our volunteer that just has this idea wants to do that, I would definitely want to be disclosing that there will be a certain amount of Bitcoin that we will hold in reserve to help fund things like that that are necessary uh, quickly. Yeah. And of course, the blockchain makes that super easy. Yeah. You know, it's like you almost, you almost don't have to do any accounting. It's just right there for you in a public ledger. So it's great for transparency for charities. So do you ladies accept other alternative currencies for donations to your organization? And what do you see as the differences between, for instance, Bitcoin and something like silver as an alternative to donating cash? 
Um, we certainly do accept uh, gold and silver. Uh, we recently had a fundraising at Liberty Forum, and uh, I was delighted when someone gave me a Kruger Rand. So, you know, we won't say no to that. I mean, you know, sure. I think gold, silver, <laughs> totally. lead, and bitcoins is what you need. <laughs> to be holding and um, but I do see a trend going sort of towards the Bitcoin more certainly I've seen people talking for the Porcupine Freedom Festival which will be June 17th through the 22nd of this year up in the White Mountains um, we've always had a very robust uh, counter economy there and in the past people would trade in gold and silver primarily in silver of course either with dime cards like um, Shire Sherry uh, Shire Shire, yeah, yeah. yeah, Shire Silver, sorry, too many Shires. Yeah. And, um, you know, people would trade with dime cards, people would trade in coins. Um, this year, I've actually heard some of our vendors say um, they're thinking about not accepting silver just because it's so hard and just going straight to a Bitcoin uh, economy at, at the event. So it's probably one of the first places in the world, and you could have done this two years ago, you could buy, you know, Lou Rocky Road ice cream with, uh, your, with a Bitcoin. And let me just put this in perspective. These people are alternative currency freaks. They hate the Federal Reserve. They don't want to use their money, and they would love <laughs> any chance they could get to use alternative currency. And so for somebody to say, oh, you know, we're going to be picky. We're not going to accept silver. We're going to prefer Bitcoins instead. That's a huge deal. And this is in the middle of the woods, too, with uh, <laughs> cell phone reception that sometimes is a little spotty. So, I mean, this is a huge deal, people preferring to accept Bitcoins over silver. So, okay, I want to ask, do you think that uh, your organizations have gotten more support because you accepted Bitcoin or simply because you accepted Bitcoin? Like just from people who are Bitcoiners and they're excited and they're like, oh, here's a charity that accepts Bitcoin. I think I'll give them a donation. For sure. I, I think with free aid, we definitely, um, we, got, we got a big bump when we announced that we were abandoning our, our IRS application on April 15th um, to become a nonprofit. And, and some we, coverage in the Huffington Post, which probably yes. publicized a lot. Uh, and, we were, and we were announcing then that we were becoming a Bitcoin-based charity. We, we got a big bump in donations from that, and I'm, that's, I'm sure, directly related to um, the fact that we're, you know, becoming Bitcoin-based and people wanted to support what we were doing and uh, and the work that we're doing and um, our reasons for wanting to go with Bitcoin. Yeah. So definitely. And and from early on, we, we've had a lot of people that um, have come up to our booth at Porkfest, for example, even two years ago, we were, you know, asking, do you take Bitcoin? And, uh, and so absolutely, I think that um, without accepting it we wouldn't we they probably wouldn't have given us cash instead i think what she's uh, really saying is yes we are willing to accept all the bitcoin millionaires donations <laughs> well, sure. there's, you know, you know there is i mean i mean it in a serious way as well i mean there is a sense of people feel a sense of wealth that they may not have felt otherwise and that's exciting because that means you you can be more generous than you could be in the past. You know, maybe now it's like you might not have given a, you know, a hundred and sixty dollar or two hundred dollar donation, but you're like, you know what? I'm just going to send over one bitcoin because it's going to make me feel good because I'm sitting and on it. And it's so easy. All you have to do is type it in and you know, wait for a few minutes for it to confirm. No PayPal, no fees, and yeah, nobody's stopping you. I mean, and we can talk about PayPal because I'm sure we all have pretty <laughs> nightmare experiences. Yeah, you know? I think all of our organiz Yeah, sure. Let's talk about the legacy banking system. So what have you experienced with your organization that has made it more difficult to focus on your mission as a charity, nonprofit, educational organization, whatever, from the legacy banking system that Bitcoin gets around? Well, I have a couple of stories, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> PayPal has twice locked down our account. Um, I, I want to say arbitrarily, but they first locked us down uh, after our very first $1,000 donation. Uh, immediately afterward, they decided to confiscate our funds because we weren't a 501c3 organization yet. But even the IRS says that, you know, you, as long as before you become a, you know, before they recognize that, you still are operating as a nonprofit and yep. they still say that. So even after providing all this paperwork, PayPal never did. And so I had to open yet another bank account because PayPal won't let you transfer 
uh, it, it was just a nightmare. It took me, as the treasurer, you know, it took me about two weeks to get this straightened out, and, and I had to self-fund. That was right before our very first Park Fest as a group at Free Aid, and I had to self-fund a lot of it just because um, I, I knew that I was going to be able to straighten out the PayPal, but a lot of our donations um, for our startup expenses were already in that $1,000, for example, and uh, I knew I knew it would, I was going to be eventually successful, which I was, but that was just a nightmare as a as I would say that's a barrier to charitable work. Huge barrier. <laughs> yeah. Huge barrier. I'm glad I was able to cover it, but um, you know, not all charities would be able to do that and um, yeah. make that come out okay. So that's just one example of a nightmare scenario I've experienced with the banking system right now. Yeah. I mean, do you? Does anybody else have a comment about that? With, go ahead. You know, we, the. Um, the kind of people who started antiwar.com are, are always early adapters and always doing, like looking for new things, but the subject matter itself, the nature of the nonprofit makes us much more conservative with how we deal with things. So, I mean, we've had, you know, I'd say neutral experiences, you know, in terms of the, the practical matters of dealing with PayPal, uh, the major credit card process, and, and so on. But there are, of course, people who will have different, you know, ethical standards about who and what means they want to use. They, you know, credit because all these issues like PayPal and credit cards have other ethical issues attached to them. Too. I imagine there are lots of uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange supporters who are not thrilled with PayPal and credit cards. Yeah. Well, right. Well, the. Um, that's, and that's one of the things, too, is when you're dealing, I mean, the nature of our particular topic is so hypersensitive and controversial. I mean, just talking about anti-war things can sometimes make people all freeze up and nervous that, you know, we tend to err on the side of conventionality and caution because, obviously, as you know, the FBI and others monitor organizations. I mean, it's just that reality. List, Angela. That, yes. And it's, <laughs> We're all on a list. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah. So do you, do you ladies think that um, if you were starting your organization today from scratch and you decided that you were going to go set it up with Bitcoin, how do you think it would be different from how you originally set up the organization? Do you think it's easier? Do you think it lowers the barrier to entry for starting a charity? Sure, I think so. And I think um, I like that you use charity and not nonprofit because, you know, nonprofit in some ways is part of a, a status language. It's part of the government language. It's them giving you a license or giving you freedom, you know, not to pay taxes on something that should be a voluntary transaction between two human beings. I mean, it's one of the best transactions is someone who is truly giving charity from their heart, whether, you know, it's an atheist to a Christian or a Christian to an atheist or whoever is doing it it's you want to help someone and really the government should not be in the middle of that transaction and they should not be giving you a permission slip to say hey we'll let you keep a hundred percent of your money gee thank you so I think <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know it's really exciting to to start a charity and just to say I'm a Bitcoin charity I am outside your matrix we're on this side guys you know and you can you can work in your system and you know, more power to you on that side of the fence, but we think on this side of the fence, we have a better, more peaceful, more prosperous way to live our lives, and we're going to decide how to give money between private people as a private transaction. Yeah, and for, for free aid, oh, thank you. For free aid, yes. Um, if, if we had, you know, we started in 2010, um, or early 2011 is when we created our bank account, but we actually kind of founded the organization in late 2010. Uh, if we had to do it again, uh, the only reason I... Um, got a taxpayer ID number and started getting into the system is because in order to be a professional nonprofit and have funds separate from my own personal funds as the treasurer, I had to have a bank account. And um, at the time, I was aware of Bitcoin, but I wasn't, uh, there weren't nearly as much uh, services and infrastructure out there, and I really wasn't even thinking about banking with Bitcoin back then. But if I knew then what I know now, uh, what would have been possible, I would have absolutely skipped that whole process. I would have never filed for a taxpayer ID number, which I can't even begin to tell you that was like the hardest decision I've made as yeah. Free treasurer was to, it was a super simple process, go on the IRS website and get a taxpayer ID number, but I knew that would set in motion a whole host of paperwork and hassle and all kinds of stuff. And possibly, you know, political prosecution Absolutely. from the IRS who are now in charge of our health care. 
Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And uh, that sucks. Yeah, that's a good point. We should write a blog post about that. But anyway, the um, yeah, if I had known then, I would have just banked with um, my friend through my friends through local bitcoins like I do now, and uh, wouldn't wouldn't have hassled with the PayPal and anything. We would find another solution uh, to and work mostly with uh, with Bitcoin. So you know, I think a lot of charities are sort of in the system because they see a trade-off between how big they can get or how much growth they can experience. And, you know, there are advantages. I like, I, for, I'm familiar with anti-war. I think, you know, there are lots of people who want to write off charitable donations on their taxes. And so that's one reason to have this, this status, you know, of recognition, permission from the IRS. So do you see a trade-off between that, uh, the size of an organization and using Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin only for small charities or could any charity potentially benefit from it? Oh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what antiwar.com would look like today if it were totally reorganized under the Bitcoin, because it really was very much under, you know, an older system, you know, pre, you know, pre the rise of, you know, kind of cultural anarchism before people started doing things like the Free State Project. So you kind of did things the old school way. And, um, but you know, I don't. I don't know if there'd be. I mean, I'm, it's, it's really. I don't. I don't know yet because I still think it's very, very small and it's still very controversial. Even if we kind of understand it, most people still kind of would say, yeah, it's a pretty fringy. Okay. And uh, you know, I think uh, Teresa's decision or Free Aid's decision to go Bitcoin based is is really brave, and I think it makes sense because it's a uh, it's a pretty young organization, so it's starting from the ground up. If you're a legacy organization, um, you know, the Free State Project's been around for 10 years. Uh, we're in our second round of applying for 501c3, so hopefully they don't watch this tape. But, um, you know, we, there's a reason for that. And, of course, it's because, you know, there are large donors out there, and that is one of the things that they look at. Um, you know, we're, we're going to start to create a different donor base. You know, I circle back to the Bitcoin millionaires, and that'll be, you know, our... Coke money of the future, so to speak. Awesome. K O C H, oh. not C O K E. Yes. <laughs> oh yes, we should clarify. <laughs> Is this not the Silk Road Coke? <laughs> right. Just want to get that clear. And actually, we should talk about Silk Road because one of the the things that you know we hear a lot is that. Oh, Bitcoin's just used for drugs or for nefarious purposes. Right. But Zero Hedge did a, a survey a while ago, and you know it w I think it was under 20% went to Silk Road. 10% yeah. had, had said that they had ever bought drugs online on the Silk Road. And over 50% 50, 50 you know, it was 55 or 56% said that they had used Bitcoins as donations. Exactly. So yeah. donations are, according to this survey, the most common use of Bitcoins. And I think that's really important to point out because they really do have this sort of undeserved reputation. And the more charities we can have out there, especially since Bitcoin makes it so easy to start a charitable organization, um, the more charities we can have out there, the better. And the more people think of Bitcoin as a tool that can really be used to help and empower people. I would really love to see lots of different organizations, not just charities, not just Silk Road, but like all different. I want the economy to be full and robust. And the more we can do to talk more people into using Bitcoin, and accepting Bitcoin, the, the less powerful fiat money and U.S. dollars on the U.S. government will be, and the less likely they will be to spend their money on unpopular projects that would never receive voter support like wars. But this is also a really good opportunity for freedom organizations to exploit the Bitcoin world because the people who adapt Don't to Bitcoin... Don't tell them you're exploiting them. We're exploiting them. <laughs> this is a perfect opportunity, and I see many libertarians in the audience. This is the perfect time to be propagandizing to an audience that's very, very open to the future, that wants to see new ideas, that really likes the Bitcoins not bombs process because they want to see a less violent future. And this is, a, this, is, this is the audience too, the people who are on the cutting edge of technology. These people are, you know, we're looking at the future. And anarchism, which I hope I didn't overstep there, but is, <laughs> is going to be part of that. Yeah, so, okay. Um, do you think that there are any limitations that come along with an organization accepting Bitcoin, like a charity? Can you think of any downsides? Because I want to be fair and balanced here, right? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think the, the volatility is, is an issue. Um, you do, um, by default, become a currency speculator. You're speculating, in our case, because we are 
transferring back. So, you know, in the, in the way that you would be dollars to Swiss marks or whatever, and people are paying attention, it's a giant industry. Suddenly, a, you know, nonprofit or a small organization is in a situation where they're like, wow, we really need to be paying attention to this stuff because we're suddenly a currency speculator. And they know? may not have the staff or the expertise for right. that necessarily. Right, or, or not even know, you know, I mean, and, and I think it was because we were just caught up in the run-up you know, if you had been doing it the first two years, that would be much less of a concern. And I think as things tend to stabilize, but, you know, it did put a little red red flag out there, and it was like, okay, this is something we actually need to look at and pay attention to. Right. I really can't think of anything else. Um, you know, for us, transparency is really important, and Bitcoin allows for that. But maybe if, maybe if people want to put out a donation and not be transparent, maybe that would be a limitation for them, but certainly isn't a problem for us. Um, yeah, it's, I don't see any downsides to accepting it. The downsides are obvious. The feds at some point are going to crack down on, on users. I mean, they already obviously are, but I mean, on this kind of nonprofit use or charitable use, they're going to look for ways to crack down. So that would be a disadvantage, though I don't think that's a reason not to step into it because obviously the more of us who do it, the more difficult it becomes to just start mass prosecutions of people who are just trading, you know, who are doing charitable people, yeah, work? Just little yes. things, you know, little <laughs> things online. That's all we're doing. I mean, that's there's. It's really a safe, sane, voluntary activity. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, there's been talk of you know all these Bitcoin startups are coming out, and there's all this venture capital that's flowing into Bitcoin-based startups, and people are doing really well for themselves, right? And that's great. Like we support commerce and economic activity. Want to build a robust Bitcoin uh, economy and community. Um, but, you know, there's been talk of, uh, like, successful corporations in the legacy system do charitable giving. They usually set aside some percentage for charitable giving. So do you think that the Bitcoin community is ready for something like that, to have Bitcoin charities who are willing to say, yeah, we'll take your donations if you've been doing really well with Bitcoin, and we'll do something really cool with them, and we'll, you know, give you some PR? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think, I mean, I, I think about that as sort of the Whole Foods model, you know, where, where they, they, you know, they're in, they're in it for the money and they're in it for profit, but they also want to give back to the community. And I think that would be a really perfect model as these businesses start to succeed to really say, oh, you know what, we're, we're going to put up a corporate giving plan and we're going to say we're going to spend you know five percent of what comes in and we're we're going to work with organizations that do bitcoins and sort of help grow the nonprofit, the charity sector as well as you know gaining that pr so you know it's not just i mean i think greed is good don't get me wrong but you know it's it's a conversion and you have to make things palatable for other people and i do think nonprofits and charities can have a very strong role in that yeah and we're we're definitely working with bitcoin not bombs already to uh to publicize people that have sponsored our work and uh growing uh bitcoin uh charities and uh helping us with our programs as well and so uh, i would love to continue doing that with uh, additional sponsors and, and people that may want to work on specific projects with us uh, or just um, or just uh, list us among their um, charitable giving back to the community kind of thing. So I you know, would love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I could see it even going beyond just simply donating bitcoins. For instance, here at this conference, we had an offer to receive a donation of an ASIC miner, yeah. which, I mean, that's a gift that keeps on giving. That's a goose that lays golden eggs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, things like that, uh, you know, would be great for a, a charitable organization. Or even, you know, perhaps a charity could start a mining pool and uh, a percentage of the mining pool, you know, the, the pool fee is a little higher than normal and it goes to support a charity. So I see a lot of creative uses for kind of... Uh, donating bitcoins that aren't just necessarily like, okay, send them to this address. Right, we'll absolutely. I, I'd say with free aid, the only money we wouldn't take is government money. So <laughs> <laughs> any other kind of in-kind donation. Right. And, you know, we've had a few kind of interesting in-kind donations, but we'll, we'll take, uh, absolutely, the minor would be good. But yeah, the, the one thing I would refuse is any, any government money. Yeah. All right. So 
I guess I have a couple of technical questions about how you manage the Bitcoin donations for your organization. Um, first of all, who has stewardship over the Bitcoins that your organization receives? And how is continuity of an assets managed? Like, for instance, if somebody, somebody has uh, the key to the Bitcoin wallet for your organization and uh, then suddenly they quit or they pass away or something happens to that or they forget the password, how do you manage that? Uh, well, for free aid, uh, I'm the treasurer, and I'm the only one that has the private keys uh, to free aid's accounts. We actually have three addresses, um, but the one we're using, we, I ported them all over into our one free aid one, so it's all transparent now. Um, that one has all of our bitcoins in it now. Uh, and I, I asked around because I thought it would be really cool to have some kind of um, notification of some kind of like tamper evident document vault or something online where my partner could it would email me or notify sms me if someone tried to get into it but i couldn't find anything like that and so i i looked i i posted in one of the um i, I think on my feed but maybe in one of the free state uh forums asking people if they knew any apps uh that would facilitate continuity in case something happens to me as the treasurer and um abby uh Abby Gonzalez, I think his name is, one of the free staters I know, uh, told me about Death Switch, which has got a terrible brand name, but <laughs> basically I have to enter my, pa I've set up a message to go to Stephanie through Death Switch that I uh, gave her one half of the password that she needs to open the file, and um, I, uh, I enter my password into a uh, to the death switch system every month and they know I'm still alive um, so then they don't send Stephanie the other half so um, that's how we set it up for free aid uh, so that um, I like single point accountability so if some bitcoins go missing uh, you can look at me and it's either a technical problem or I have an answer for you. Uh, I, I don't like the kind of diffusion of responsibility that sometimes happens in big organizations and this was the way that I saw to solve the problem of continuity if something happens with me. Oh, that's a great idea and I'm going to steal it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, please steal any ideas yes. that you hear on this panel. We, We're all um, open source. We want to help other open organizations. Source. Exactly. Um, in our case, it's, it's the treasurer who does it and so I defer beyond that. Okay. So you have a single point of accountability too yes. with your treasurer. Yeah. Actually, I mean, there might be a couple of the techies who, who know what's going on too, but um, okay. yeah. Did you want to comment on that, Angela? Uh, I mean, one of my roles in the staff is to kind of keep track of the freaky libertarian uh, affectations that we do. So I'm in charge of the Bitcoin account. No one else is going to want it. Um, and then, of course, you know, you, in terms of passcodes, that's why you have office managers, you know, just straight old forward, you know, nonprofit management. It's kind of, we keep it really simple. Okay. Um, do you know who your Bitcoin donors are? That's another question because charities might receive donations. And if you get a donation through PayPal, you, you pretty much know who that person is. You get their name and address there. And you can send them a thank you note, or you can, if there's some kind of problem, it doesn't go through, you can let them know. But with Bitcoin donations, they can be completely anonymous, and you have no idea who sent you those Bitcoins. And so how do you deal with that? Do you know who your Bitcoin donors are? Do you get emails from them saying, hey, I sent you... 0.1 Bitcoins and... This is something yeah. I would love to have... Uh, uh applet or something I could stick on our website that would include a form and just an easy click to get to their Bitcoin wallet all in one form, uh, like a BitPay button, but with a form that collects their, um, at least their email address. And it's all optional. I wouldn't force them to fill it out, but um, you just I just want to say thanks. Right? What I found is that, you know, when you're, when you have a website, you just have to post your QR code or your, your address. And, you know, some of them have UPIs that will open a wallet, but not, not all of our donor, donors are as tech geeky as a lot of the people here, so they don't know how to make that work. And so if, if we could have more simplicity, that would be great. What we did to solve the problem was we put a little note saying, if you send us Bitcoin, please contact us. And it links to our contact us page to let us know you sent us some money um, just so that we can thank you. And uh, we really like to thank our donors and, um, you know, have it be totally optional. But we want to make it easy for people to let us know who they are so that we can really thank them and um, 
and, uh, and know, but you know, it's totally fine if we get random donations and Free Aid has been getting very, very small Bitcoin donations and I don't know why, but, um, it but we'll take them. We'll take them. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of the equivalent of somebody throwing their change in a jar. It seems like, yeah, like I'll it. give you my change. Yeah. And you know, who knows if, if we hang on to it for a couple more years, that bit dust may be able to buy us a, you know, a ticket to Porkfest or something. <laughs> yeah, I like that bit dust. That's yeah, good. <laughs> that's what they call it. Right. So um, I guess just kind of looping things back around, I forgot to mention there's a couple other things about um, the Bitcoin community kind of interfacing with charities and helping them out. There are a couple of organizations that I think deserve a mention in this area, like for instance BitPay, because what they do is they um, allow people to accept Bitcoin donation, or sorry, Bitcoin for products and services or donations, and then they immediately convert it to your favorite legacy currency. So it's a, a nice service that takes the risk out of accepting Bitcoins for a merchant who might not be comfortable with that. And for charities uh, and nonprofits, they say on their website that it's only 501c3 organizations, but if you actually go talk to them, they'll say, yeah, we can work something out. Um, <laughs> they, they do a 0% fee on that conversion. So I think they're really there to support uh, charitable organizations too. Mm -hmm. um, and do you ladies know of any, any other Bitcoin-based companies that are kind of working with charities in that way to support them? We had a couple that, there was um, somebody that we met at the conference um, just recently who has a website called, uh, I believe it's Bitcoin 100. That's right. Um, he was attempting to get charities to accept Bitcoins and was going to set them up with a wallet and have promised donations of, at the time, it was 100 Bitcoins when they were worth $10 a piece. Then later he had to change it to $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, he had a bunch of Bitcoin donations and was wanting to get charities to accept Bitcoin and would help set them up, but didn't get that many takers, quite honestly, and uh, thought that a lot of that was probably because these charities were afraid. They thought this was, you know, some crazy illegal thing and of course there's nothing illegal about it um, and it's great for charities as we've hopefully shown today so I hope some people will take advantage of that they still have quite a fund over there at Bitcoin 100 mm -hmm. yeah yeah so okay I guess just to uh, close out and then we'll take some questions from the audience if anybody has any um, I just want to get some comments finally about you know what effect do you think that Bitcoin charities have on the greater Bitcoin community um, and if you have any more comments on what effect Bitcoins have on charities or nonprofits, educational organizations. It's a big umbrella. It's all what we do. But, you know, sort of the interface between the two and any comments you want to make on that. I think Carla already covered it pretty well in one of her uh, previous answers. Um, I, I really think that having charities, it's, it makes it a really more robust economy uh, that works in Bitcoin and uh, we're part of the picture here and uh, like in free aid all of our volunteers are now new Bitcoin users and uh, you know um, a lot of them were already using Bitcoin um, very early adopters but I'd say about half of them had, had didn't have wallets set up or anything and they're getting set up now and uh, I think we do a lot to get more people into using Bitcoin and that's just really good for everyone that has Bitcoin and uses it. Uh, and it, we kind of round out um, the other side of the Silk Road <laughs> kind of branding that Bitcoin has around it. So I'd like right. to think that that helps as well. Um, you, I mean, it ultimately, I think, you know, an organization like antiwar.com, it, it lends legitimacy to the Bitcoin community because, yep. you know, it's, a, it's an organization that's been around for a really long time. It's... Um, does really important work. And so it's that legitimacy and then that grassroots tapping on, you're getting more people involved. I mean, imagine if someone could like close getting the Red Cross to take Bitcoin, then it's all over because I'm then working you're... on it. <laughs> I'm working on it, I know. Carla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then they could have donations from anywhere in the world with no red tape. It's easy to send a small amount. It's, it's just great. By the way, I want to say that we've had this table at this conference where we've been with Bitcoin Not Bombs, gotten a ton of traffic to our booth over the weekend. There's over 1,100 attendees here. And I haven't heard a single person say that they disagreed with the ideas of, you know, anti-war sentiments or the oh, phrasing not Bitcoin Not Bombs. We got so many compliments on that. And, and one of our yeah. pins that sold the best was the bomber with the Bitcoins coming out of it. And the shirts have done really well. We're, we're sold out of our smaller sizes. Uh, and that's really exciting. This on, if you're seeing this later online, you can probably order them from BitcoinNotBombs.com. Yeah, and then also freeaid.com will also have uh, shirts for sale in, um, in Bitcoin, but we also refer to the Bitcoin Not Bombs for our PayPal 
customers that insist on using credit cards, and that was always kind of fun. There were a few sheepish customers that came up to us with credit cards. <laughs> we, yeah, we made it a little bit difficult because there only one of us can accept them. So, um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's that's been it's been great. It's been a lot of fun being at the booth and talking with a lot of people that are excited about what we're doing and and uh, about the great designs that Davi Barker created for us to to use in this conference and in these shirts. We have to thank uh, Bitcoin Store also, bitcoinstore.com, for their sponsorship helping us get here as well. Yes. I appreciate that. I just wanted to say before we get, get close out is that there are people who really do want to live in their values. And if you have, you know, peace values, if, you have, you know, if you're interested in nonviolence, then Bitcoin is a voluntary consensual activity that is not part of the empire. It is not part of centralized banking. And it's important to give people the opportunity, you know, to, to allow people to really live within their values. And this is what Bitcoin, you know, it's a symbol of that. I mean, it's, it's still a very, very, very tiny percentage of donations for us. But it's, it's, part, of a, it's part of a mindset that is we do not want to participate in, in violence. Yeah, and um, I, I want to also get back. Um, gold and silver are somewhat like that too. Um, I, I kind of look at Bitcoin as kind of like an online gold or an online silver that's much easier to to trade with um, in today's current infrastructure with the internet and everything. Take some but, gold, add a teleporter, make it easy to divide and put back together and you've got Bitcoin. But a lot of the same features I like about gold, I also like about Bitcoin. It's possible to buy with cash anonymously, locally. It's possible to buy and trade peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, it's just not as easy to use nowadays. But um, one of our other sponsors was uh, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage and uh, they, they really helped uh, support our printing of our shirts and allowed us to take uh, the profits from the shirts without having to incur the expenses and so we really appreciate them and they accept uh, Bitcoin for gold and silver and uh, we have their cards at our table too, Roberts and Roberts. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much, Teresa, Carla and Angela. And uh, I want to just promote everybody's organization one more time. So Teresa's at fr33aid.com. That's free aid. Uh, volunteer medical services, networking, education for liberty-loving health professionals. Carla's at the Free State Project, freestateproject.org. If you're interested in moving to New Hampshire, getting active for more freedom in your lifetime, or you're just curious, or you want to go to a camping festival in the woods with a bunch of libertarians, check out uh, the Free State Project, freestateproject.org. And uh, the festival is porkfest, P-O-R-C-F-E-S-T.com. Angela is at antiwar.com, you know, very self-explanatory, but it's always refreshing, you know, with new articles, commentary, it's your source for anti-war news and perspectives. So ladies, thank you so much. All right, and we'll, we can take some questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? The yep. mic's over there. Sorry. You want to go first? You had your hand up first. Yeah, go ahead. I'll go oh. first. Okay. So I'm Randy Hink, and I'm the uh, executive director of the Seasteading Institute, and oh, we're yeah. accepting uh, Bitcoins also. And Great. I think this question's for you, Angela, since you seem to be the only 501c3. Um, the way we plan to deal with the IRS is measure our Bitcoins as if they were just an in-kind gift, and then when we um, record it, we'll record it for what we converted them into. Are you expecting to do the same thing? We haven't quite reached the top point where we think like that we're really, you know, I'm still waiting to see what Bitcoin looks like. We're kind of measuring it. There's been long periods where there's, if there's no push. If we don't actually push and start and tell people to do it, there's been no periods of no donation. So it's going to be probably toward the end of the year before we figure out how it is we'll measure it. But one of the things about the, because it's, because there's a log that I can show them, it's pretty streamlined and straightforward. But also the other record is that they're seeing these small increments where they're coming from into our, directly into our bank account and that's all open. So right now I'm just not concerned too much but with maybe a bigger organization, I would consult the tax attorney. <laughs> I have a follow up to that. Um, doesn't the IRS require of uh, 501c3 organizations that they report who large donors are? So how would you do that with a Bitcoin donor? Okay, you the, wouldn't. One of the things about, and okay, now wait, uh, this is understand about, one of the things about Bitcoin, and this is the same thing too with Federal Reserve notes, is that um, you can use services like Donors Trust to preserve an anonymity of your donors. Donors Trust? Right. Okay. Um, 
there is one of the things about Bitcoin is that it allows people to be completely anonymous, which is very, very important when you're dealing with controversial subjects under the current political climate or in, under the per current situation. So that part and keeping, you know, I don't, you know, we don't reveal names of donors. I gotcha. mean, unless, you know, we've been the most, you know, we keep it right, uh, you know, with whatever the most minimal legal requirement is. And if anyone has a problem with that, we'll be talking to the ACLU about it or who else other Excellent. defends the privacy of people Great. to give as they see freely. Gotcha. Okay, next question. Oh, I was just wondering about, uh, you know, you were talking, Teresa was talking about, you know, wishing she had started from scratch and just done... Bitcoin and no other currency. I'm just wondering, you think about the trade-off of all the people that would have given you money that don't understand Bitcoin or maybe don't even believe in Bitcoin for whatever reason, you know? And so I'm just wondering uh, whether, if you want to speak to that a little bit. Uh, well, um, from the beginning, free aid has been mostly supported by cash at events like Porkfest, and we've we've received very few donations online. And most of the online donations we re received were from uh, people I knew from events I went and spoke with, uh, like Bay Area Voluntarists have been incredibly generous with us. Um, and so, I I don't think it would have I don't think we would have missed out on that many donations. Uh, I think we probably would have come out about even, honestly, um, if not maybe even ahead because we're an early adopter and there are a lot of wealthy Bitcoin people maybe maybe they like what we're doing and being I, I think we're probably the first Bitcoin based charity um, and we're certainly evangelizing um, use of Bitcoin and and all of the great technologies we run across that make it easy for us uh, like the Lamassu machine I can just use it and not have to worry about keeping my cash straight and paying fees to my bank for depositing large amounts of cash like they're mostly charging now um, you know so I think that in the end um, I think we're probably about even for our organization. Now, that would be very different for antiwar.com. Um, we started in, like I said, late 2010, so um, that really allowed us to, um, to use Bitcoin more seamlessly than some older organizations have. So, Great. Good. Next question. Okay. Oh, there we go. Hi. Well, so I just first of all wanted to commend you all for amazing work that you're doing. And um, I'm fairly new to this whole community and learning a lot. Um, and so there may this may be already happening. But one of the things I've been thinking about in this conference is the amount of um, money that is being saved or earned by just the fact of uh, Bitcoin or the the reduced cost of uh, transactions through like BitPay's reduced cost versus uh, PayPal or whatever. Um, is there a larger sort of overarching umbrella effort that is being pushed by someone or, or some entity to encourage the organizations that are making that money or saving that money to either reinvest it in Bitcoin to strengthen the currency um, or to invest it in charitable um, you know, organizations or, or a foundation maybe like a Bitcoin foundation. I know there is one, but maybe something that's focused on uh, investing. Um, the, the, the money that's going to start it probably is and will start flowing. Um, it just seems like you know, we should uh, at least try to grasp a fraction of, of what everyone is getting out of this and, yeah. and put it into good causes. So I, I think you just wrote the marketing proposal for the Whole Foods part of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah, can is, you know, a great pass thing. along you the savings, with. you know. Well, we can, That's we, a can great do things, idea. Yeah, we can do things to help people visualize the amount of money saved. Um, and especially from, uh, we, we have um, volunteers all over the world. And um, if one of them decides to come to Porkfest, it would be so nice just to just send them a Bitcoin and not have to worry about wiring fees and all that kind of nonsense and um, and then whatever exchange rate they decide to gouge you with or whatever it's just a Bitcoin you know um, uh, that um, I, I love how much you can save um, versus the usurious fees that some of these credit cards charge and things like that yeah and honestly if you have the, the time the energy like start it you know this is yeah. a completely voluntary world and i think that would be awesome. such a great idea like we'll we'll help out with it i mean yeah sure yeah. <laughs> yeah. yay thanks next question hi i'm from let's talk bitcoin i have a comment for angela and then a question for the panel uh the comment is uh if you are writing original content mm -hmm. and you're not currently monetizing it 
then there are some very interesting ways that you can do that with Bitcoin. I'd love to talk to you about that after the uh, talk. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, this is a little bit of a long one. There, uh, so, so the Red Cross in Haiti was a bit of a disaster by any real standard. And a big part of that, and the reason why they were used, is because they have the infrastructure in order to collect the funds and to raise the funds. And then, essentially, they don't perform a lot of the charity themselves. Instead, they find the contractors or charities that do it for them. What I've been thinking about is the idea of like a meta Red Cross or meta charities, where basically you have a platform for charities, and instead of you know, having specific causes that you as an organization are doing, you have all of these little micro charities listed with the people behind them and the projects and the goals, and then, you know, and then again, the uh, one click ability to donate Bitcoins to them through that way so that you can see in a very real way where the money is going and directed at a granular level. Do you think that that's something that any of your charities would be interested in looking at building platforms? for? Absolutely. That's basically Bitcoin, not bombs. It totally. That's what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the idea. I think it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Definitely. Anybody else have a comment? Yeah, I, I guess I just want to add, um, we, we all believe that people should decide who to volunteer with. You know, United Way aggregates money. I choose not to do that. It's kind of a lazy way. They take a huge overhead. Um, and Bitcoin Not Bombs does not to take no. a huge overhead, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, but like, um, if you, if to make it easy for people that just don't want to look into anything, they just want to donate to a bunch of Bitcoin charities, you know, or whatever, that's fine. Um, we can aggregate. But we also believe in if people just really, really want to donate to anti-war. I had someone come up to the table and I said, I, I feel kind of bad, but I really only donate to anti-war. I'm like, oh, so do I. And Carla was standing right next to me and she said, so do I. So, you know, um, that was pretty fun. And we, we, this should be voluntary. You shouldn't have to feel coerced into donating to anyone you don't want to support. And so we want to make it easy. If you want to make, donate to all these, then you can. And if not, then that's fine too. Yeah, okay, one, one last question. Yeah, I got a quick comment and then a question. I think, Teresa, you mentioned trying to get the Red Cross on board, and I think that would be an amazing thing. And something they do when you see their, um, like, pledge drives or whatever, when there's a disaster, they put a, oh, text this number. But how much easier would it be for them to just put a QR code in the bottom of the screen and say, right. donate what you want by scanning this QR code and sending us Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh, but my question was to, towards Carla. Um, since uh, the Free State Project accepts Bitcoins and then uh, soon thereafter turns them into cash, is there a reason that you guys don't use uh, BitPay? Is there a reason could, where it just automatically happens for you? Um, I think they're looking into it, and he may even be on it already. As I said, like I'm not the, on the technical right. side. I just trust the people <laughs> who are going to do it to do it right and to do it well. Um, they may be automatically on it. I th already, and if not, we can let them know. Yeah, I just wondered if there was a reason yeah. behind that. All right, cool. Great. Everybody, thank you so much for coming to our panel. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks, ladies, for being on the panel.